In 2018, a leading pop star released a hit song titled God is a Woman. Maybe some of you are familiar with the song, you've heard of it, listened to it before, some of you are nodding knowingly, you've heard the song, you've seen the music video, it very quickly became a top 10 single in the Billboard Top 100, the official YouTube videos of this song, both the uh, music video and the uh, lyrics video have been viewed a combined uh, 500 million times on YouTube, a very, very popular song, and as you could sort of imagine from the song's title, the song sort of lives at the intersection of uh, feminism and religion and sexuality. That's sort of, those are sort of the three things. You'd agree? You've seen it? Those three things kind of is where the song lives. And uh, it was a very, very popular song, and it got a number of responses. Many of them were very favorable. Some of the titles reacting and articles reacting to this song uh, were uh, titles like this. Uh, the God is a Woman video is an incredible manifesto for empowering female sexuality. Another title responding to the song was, God is a Woman is the female power anthem we need. Uh, some of the responses to the song were critical. They felt that it tied female empowerment too much to the image of, of sexuality. And so maybe even some of you are familiar with the social media trend, God is a Woman and her name is, which uh, is a little bit, uh, broadens that out a little bit more to different pictures of women and what women being successful and powerful looks like. Um, underneath both of these responses, some people responded to the song by asking the question that the song really raises, which is, how do we speak about God and why? And what metaphors and language do we use to speak about God and why? This is really the question that's at stake with this sort of song. And it's just fascinating, of course, that all of a sudden, 500 million people would watch different videos related to the asking and answering of this question. Right? Because it really seems like in our culture that no one cares to talk about God, just honestly, in public discourse. No one's talking about God unless like something comes up where we're like, well, we'll talk about God in a way that overthrows something that we feel like is traditional or something like that. And then we all want to talk about God. There are other reasons. Uh, I don't mean to sound cheeky there. There are other really serious and significant reasons why someone would seriously ask the question, how do we talk about God and why? Maybe it is a little bit of the cultural moment that we're in. But maybe there's a justice concern, that people are asking justice questions around the fair treatment of women in society and the church. And they're looking at that question and then are saying, how does that come into dialogue with how we talk about God and why? Some people are asking this question because of a deep personal concern. Some people would say, I have mostly had bad experiences with men in my life. And so when the only language that's available to me to talk about God is masculine language, that already puts an obstacle up for me. Some people are there. And when people are experiencing that question, there's a significant amount of pain and challenge and hurts that can be a part of that question. And yet I think the Bible has another lens on why we should ask the question, how do we speak about God? The Bible would lead us to think that there is a saving concern, not just a justice concern and not just a personal concern, though those are important, but the Bible would say, in order to be saved in our hour of need, we need to be clear about who we are calling on and how we speak about that being in a way that we're simple and clear in the way that we are calling on them. These questions matter. It matters that people can personally connect to God. It matters that people are treated in a way that reflects God's just character. It matters that we speak about God faithfully and in a way that respects and treats God's nature and holiness seriously. And it matters that we know who to call on when we need help. When we are in our hour of need, it, we need to know who to call on. And how can we call on God when we don't even know what to call God? How can we call on God when we don't even know what to call God? These are really significant and important questions, and we're going to be looking at them today. I've titled today's sermon, How Should I Speak About God? And we've been in the middle of a sermon series titled Empowered, where we have been walking through uh, different uh, lenses on what the Holy Spirit is doing in this time as we're uh, working up to Pentecost. But that sermon series is paused today, and since today is Mother's Day and Father's Day is just a month away, and we're in the season of thanking God for our earthly mothers and fathers, I thought I would take a moment to do a bit of an explainer sermon around a, a particular cultural question, namely God language. How do we speak about God and why? And my goal in this sort of a sermon or a sermon series when I do something like this is to take a cultural question that, that people are talking about, that people are thinking about, that you see in pop culture, that you, you hear when, when you're talking with your friends, when they ask you questions about your church and your faith life, to take one of those questions 
and to explore it in a rigorous way intellectually, but also to speak to the spiritual currents that are underneath the question. Because some of these questions can make us feel like our faith is being eroded or shipwrecked. Right? When people, there are some people when they come to the question of, oh, how do I speak about God and why? Maybe they think, oh gosh, I've learned that there are other people who speak about God in all sorts of other different ways. Has my church been lying to me? Is my faith just one sort of parochial thing? But if I were to move outside of my faith, I'd be free to explore what's really true? Am I a part of an oppressive or abusive institution? And we have certain types of questions that they present themselves up here at the intellectual level. How should I speak about God? But underneath, there are spiritual currents that can spring a leak in the boat of our faith. And what I'm trying to do in a sermon like this is I'm trying to patch it up. <laughs> I'm trying to patch that up in the power of preaching to both understand what this conversation is about and then mediate the authority of Jesus uh, into this question. So that if that is you or if you know people for whom their faith might spring a leak around a question like this, that place can be patched up. It can be caulked. And in the future, if the ship of your faith were to come to go up against this question in a meaningful way, you would go, that's actually, I, I understand that actually. That's set and, and satisfied for me. And so there's no chance that I'll spring a leak there. Um, I'll also note that in a sermon like this, uh, you should be assessing what I'm saying. <laughs> this is not about you like the pastor coming up here and saying, this is how you should think. Uh, in my sense, you should be evaluating what I'm saying in two ways. First, you should be saying, does the pastor understand the scope of this conversation? But then the second thing you should be asking is, is the pastor mediating the words and authority of Jesus and the scriptures into this question? And you need to grow up in your faith and do that and stand up and say, my faith is my faith in relationship to God. And the pastor, whoever that person is, has authority to the extent that they are standing in the vein of spiritual authority that comes from Jesus. Amen. So you should be doing that over the course of the sermon. You should be looking for that. Does Adam understand the scope of this conversation? And is Adam mediating the authority of Jesus and the scriptures? And I would encourage you to be looking for that as we go. Our text today is going to be Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. I'll let you flip there for a second. I encourage you to open up a Bible if you've got one or a device. We, we need to, if we, if we don't feel comfortable opening up the Bible in church, we're not going to feel comfortable opening up the Bible anywhere. So this is educational time. It's practice. Even just practice flipping to the Gospel of Matthew and knowing how to get there and how to get to chapter 6, all that sort of stuff. We're going to be in chapter 6, verse 9. Uh, of course, if you ever didn't have a Bible, you can take a physical one. Great job, Joyce, killing it on the physical Bible <laughs> retention. F fantastic. And you can keep that. Anyone can keep any of the Bibles that they take back there. Again, we're in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. I'll read the text aloud. <sighs> Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. <laughs> the word of the Lord. <laughs> there are three major aspects to this question of how do we speak about God and why, and all three of them are addressed and dealt with right here in eight words of Jesus. It's very like Jesus to address a complex, complicated problem in eight words. <laughs> This is all we need. We need eight words from Jesus in order to get some clarity about this. The first uh, thing, and there, there are three words in here that will sort of orient how we're looking at this. The first thing is the word heaven. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, in heaven. God is in heaven. God is a spirit. Jesus says God is a spiritual being. How do you speak rightly of a spiritual being? On earth, we are humans on earth in the flesh. And so there are ways that we speak about other humans that are given to us because of the givenness of our physical bodies and the way that we exist right now on the earth. But God is not a human in the flesh on earth. God is God, spirit in heaven. And often when we talk about God, we're reaching for metaphors and images and language that we have accessible to us as humans in the flesh on earth. And then we're using them to talk about God, who's a spirit in heaven. But God as a spirit does not exist in a biologically sexed and gendered way in the same way that we do living in a body of flesh. And so there's a real question 
about how to speak rightly when all we have available to us are human tools of language about a being that is categorically different from the way that we live on earth? This is the basic question. Now, you may be unaware that, maybe you are aware, you may be aware or unaware. Those are the options. <laughs> you may be aware, you may be unaware. <laughs> Those are your choices. You may be aware or unaware that there is a uh, tradition, because obviously uh, you're all here, you're in church, the dominant tradition has been to use masculine language to talk about God and the church and often in society, but there is a tradition that has existed for thousands of years in the church and in the scripture of using female language and metaphors to talk about God. So I want to show you just uh, two uh, little snippets of uh, authoritative people from church history. One is St. Jerome. St. Jerome in this Quote, he's referencing a text that's being used in a lost early Christian document. Just skip that part. The important part is what he says in the second half, okay? So just listen to this quote, right? For also in that gospel written according to the Hebrews, this is the part where, what is that? We don't know, but all that sort of stuff. Um, which the Nazareans read, the Lord says, just now my mother, the Holy Spirit, took me. This is the key part. Nobody should be offended by this. For among the Hebrews, the spirit is said to be of the feminine gender, although in our language it is called to be of masculine gender, and in the Greek language, neuter. Right? Jerome is saying human language is gendered. And in Hebrew, the word spirit is feminine. And in Greek, it's neuter. And in Latin, it's masculine. And so it, no one should be offended by people drawing on the gendered reality of that language to unfold a certain metaphor image for God. Let's look at John Calvin. Okay, John Calvin. Father, reform theology, right? John Calvin. This is what he says about a picture in Isaiah about God being portrayed as a mother. By an appropriate comparison, he shows how strong is his anxiety about his people, comparing himself to a mother whose love toward her offspring is so strong and ardent as to leave far behind it a father's love. Thus, he did not satisfy himself with proposing the example of a father, which on other occasions he very frequently employs, but in order to express his very strong affection, he chose to liken himself to a mother and calls them not merely children, but the fruit of the womb. The Bible has a rich tradition also of using female images and languages to talk about God, and in some ways the Holy Spirit in particular. Many of the metaphors to describe the Holy Spirit's action in the Bible are metaphors that have been traditionally understood to be feminine. The Holy Spirit as a comforter. The Holy Spirit who births children. These are feminine images. But this isn't just an intellectual question, it's a, or, or just a question of sort of digging back into church history and seeing what people did in the past. It's a question that has real impact and felt consequences for people. There are real stakes involved. And as a result of those stakes, I'm going to unfold today four ways that people sort of use to decide how they're going to speak about God. Okay, so you should be looking at this for four ways that people use to decide how they will speak about God. Um, with regard to these things that are at stake for us, there are arguably two things at stake. We want to speak about God truly. We want to speak true language and true speech about God. But for many people, especially when the conversation about masculine God language is brought into the picture, there are people for whom the treatment of women and justice for women in church and in the society is a very, very important issue. And this is what is difficult about our language for God. All language for God, okay, all the language that we use to speak about God in the world is human language, and so it has the potential to be manipulated and misused by sin, right? In a world that has tended across cultures to be tempted to view women as subordinates or less powerful or less valuable or economized, it's very easy to see how that reality could get mixed with masculine language about God in a way that could harm women. It's hard to think about masculine God language with respect to the problem of patriarchy. For example, the question, do we just talk about God this way because men have wanted to talk about God this way? <laughs> right? That's a real question that people would ask. Or the problem of hierarchy. Has there been a historic use of masculine God language to justify subordination and abuse of women in society or in the church? And just to give an example of one person for whom this is very important. I'm provi uh, providing a quote from a feminist scholar named Elizabeth Johnson, a feminist theologian. She's written one of the most seminal feminist theological texts in the last 50 years. And this is one of the first questions and problems she 
brings up in her text, the problem of the way in which otherwise good masculine images of God can get mixed with sinful societal structures and can be used to harm women. This is what she says. Literal patriarchal speech about God is both oppressive and idolatrous. It functions to justify social structures of dominance and subordination and an androcentric, male-centric worldview inimical to the genuine and equal human dignity of women. There's obvious concern about this today. And even if you're listening to this and you're going, gosh, I haven't quite thought about this before, or this conversation isn't present in my church tradition, these are the questions that our culture is asking. These are the questions that are keeping our culture from coming to the loving God of the Bible. So we've got to be able to talk about them. We've got to be able to think about them. We need to understand them and mediate Christological, scriptural truth to them. There should be concern about this in the church today. The way we speak about God should lift up all people and not be used to put people down. And for some... This way of thinking about God is decisive. The way of thinking about how to speak about God that looks at an issue of justice in a society and says, however we need to speak about God to rectify that should be determinative of how we speak about God. So one way, the first way that sometimes people decide how to speak about God is to look at an injustice in society and say, however we need to speak about God to rectify that, that should change our speech about God. And of course, there's an element of that that is reflective of the justice and mercy of God who cares about people who are overlooked. At the same time, this first way that people can decide to speak about God often bumps up against a second way in our time and our society that people can often use to think about how they will speak about God. As much as examining the ways we speak about God for traces of sin and injustice is a real and worthy and God-honoring pursuit we also live in a time where this, uh, where this pursuit is happening along another current, namely the generally human but also particularly modern desire to make God into our own image, to speak about God and imagine God and believe in a God that is constructed and controlled and judged by me, to make God into a God that just affirms everything that I already want to be affirmed about myself. And however I need to speak about God in order to make that a reality, I'll speak about God that way. That is a second major way that people can use in their minds to be determinative about how they will speak about God. How do I need to speak about God in order to affirm me? That is a second major current that exists in this discussion. And so today, some people are just like, it basically doesn't matter how you talk about God. You can talk about God kind of however you want. You can make God more particular. You can make God further away. It kind of doesn't matter just so long as God is affirming the things about you that you want to be affirmed. And so you talk about God kind of however you want. And we experience that. And at first, that sort of looks like freedom. Because at first, that looks like, cool. I get to talk about God however I want. And there's a way of kind of reading God's character that makes people think, sure, God's loving. And so he doesn't really care about how you talk about it. You can talk about him however you want. But the Bible would say that the so-called freedom that we're expressing in that moment is actually coming at a very high cost, and that cost is our view of God. At the same moment that we think we're expressing our freedom by talking about God however we want to, we are radically diminishing the view of God that we have. Because we speak in common, everyday ways about common, everyday things. And so when we use whatever old language we want to describe God, we're saying, God, you're just sort of some whatever old thing that I can kind of talk about however I want, just like I would talk about anything else that doesn't really matter. The Bible says that the God who is in heaven is uncommon. He's set apart. He matters. Capital M matters. It's the only thing that matters. He's holy. And as a result, our speech about God must also be uncommon, set apart, and holy. And in a world of careless words, in a world and a church that's constantly making and remaking God in our own image, in a world that doesn't care about how you speak about God so long as it works for you, the people of God, of all people, should take a posture of deeply caring about how we speak about God. God matters, and so it matters how we speak about God. This gets us to the second major word that Jesus uses, right? Our Father in heaven, hallowed 
in the ESV, just literally holy. Holy be your name. To speak of God as having a name is to speak of a God that you can call on with personal specificity. And Jesus says that that kind of speech about this God should be holy. It should be holy and it should be different and it should be set apart. To speak of holiness is to speak about this set apartness and how these things should be treated as such. Speech that isn't holy, the Bible calls like blasphemy, right? Like taking God's name in vain. Now, we often read that first in the moralistic sense. Blasphemer, you ah, blasphemy, you know, and we're like, it's like we're saying that speech is bad or something. But if we were to actually come to any moral judgment, maybe of any kind, we should first understand the spiritual reality and nature that's behind it, right? That gives us birth to the word in the first place. Blasphemy is not primarily bad speech. It's speech that does not correspond to the nature of the spiritual reality that's being talked about. It's speech that's not appropriate for the nature of the thing that's being spoken about. That's what it means to blaspheme. We can talk about later if it's good or if it's bad. You know, whatever. We just In church, we've just been trained to jump to the moral things. We're just always jumping there. But first, what it's about to take God's name in vain or to speak in a way that's blasphemous is to speak in a way where our language does not correspond to the holiness of the spiritual reality of God. Of course, it's funny. We recognize this in the world. We recognize this dynamic of language in the world, this linguistic spiritual reality in the world. Uh, we recognize it with art, with great works of art. Uh, up on the screen is a... <laughs> This is a picture of Gustav Klimt's 1908 painting, The Kiss. Right? If you Google most beautiful paintings, <laughs> this is one of the ones that's going to come up. Stanzi and I got to see it personally in Vienna at the Belvedere like eight years ago when we were traveling in Europe. It, it tr and it's huge. I mean, it truly is a, a marvel to behold. I mean, look at all the things that are happening in this painting. All the gold <laughs> and all the movement and motion in the gold and, and the way that the cloaks of the one overlap the cloaks of the other. It's like they, they, they meld into each other in this dramatic meshing of gold. And look at how, like, how their bodies are represented in ways that are actually anatomically disproportionate in order to draw your attention to the beauty of what's happening. So for example, her legs. Look at where her legs are bent. Like her, her knees bend at like the mid, you know, shin. Like, but she's so long, right? She's got this length to her that's been given that, that communicates wisdom and, and, and just closeness. And look at his neck. That guy's neck. I mean, really look at that neck. If that guy were to pick his head up from that kiss, he would look insane. His neck is way too big, but it's like this wrapping around, right? And these techniques and, and then the, 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 the flowers on the, it's, it's incredible. It's an incredible, glorious work of art. And what if I said, isn't it cool how we looked at this craft that Clint put together. <laughs> what if I was like, isn't it cool that we looked at Klimt's art project today? <laughs> like, isn't this nice that he has this little hobby? <laughs> that You are laughing because you know that language doesn't fit. It doesn't fit this reality. I, I, I feel this way about the Claire de Lune. I, I think the Claire de Lune is the most beautiful piece of music to ever been written. You can disagree with me about that, but if you trash the Claire de Lune, we're done. <laughs> you and me are done. <laughs> Blasphemy. You should at least speak in a way that corresponds to the incredible height that that piece of music has reached. We do this in the world. We do this with art. We do this with things that we see. What does this reveal about how we speak about God? When we speak about God as some common, everyday, careless thing that we can do whatever we want with. What does that reveal? It reveals that it's been too long since we've seen the nature of God. We have forgotten the nature of God. And so our speech so often does not correspond. Listen, of all the different ways that this conversation could go and all the different ideas that it goes to, the one thing that is utterly untenable in the question of how we speak about God is that it just doesn't matter. That's the only thing that is utterly untenable, that you can speak about God however you want because it doesn't matter. There's no place for that whatsoever. And this is creeping into the church. No people have ever claimed to have faith in God like we do today and yet hold such a low view of God as we do today. 
we recognize holiness in art, in the world, and we speak accordingly, but we don't recognize it in God. And yet, God's beauty, if you could see God's beauty for one second, you would sell all the art in all the museums that have ever existed just to buy any more time to continue to gaze on the beauty and the glory of the living God. And, and God's voice is so melodious. It's so beautiful in its sound that if you could hear the voice of God for one moment, you would delete all the music that has ever been written just to hold one silent void in space where the song of God can be sung. And the sweetness of God has such a taste, has such a sweetness to it that if you could taste just a scrap of it, you would never eat again for fear of washing any of that taste out of your mouth. God is so beautiful and so worthy and so wonderful and so merciful and so just and so powerful and so welcoming to you. He is so holy and set apart. And our speech needs to reflect the holiness of the nature of the living God. Would that God's name would be kept holy. This brings us to the third way that people can think to speak, uh, that people can use to think about how to speak to God. Not just looking at a societal injustice and saying, how should we speak about God to rectify that? Not just looking at me and saying, how can I speak about God to have God be made in my image? But a third way where we say, how do we speak about God in a way that reflects God's holiness? That's a third way that we can think about how to speak about God. And there is no book, no text, no artifacts that cares so much about speaking about God in a way that reflects God's holiness than the Bible. And the Bible teaches us how to speak about the holiness of the living God. And when the Bible does that, the Bible will use both masculine and feminine images. For example, when discussing the tenderness of God towards God peop God's people, it uses the image of a comforting mother, Isaiah 66, 13. As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. You will be comforted in Jerusalem. When portraying God is able to defeat his enemies, God is portrayed as a mighty warrior. Isaiah 42, 13. The Lord goes out like a mighty man, like a man of war. He stirs up his zeal. When portraying God's anger at how God's children have deserted him, it uses the image of an angry mother bear deprived of her cubs. Like a bear robbed of her cubs, I will attack them and tear them asunder. When portraying God as above all other gods, it describes God as a great king. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Jesus said that God's longing to gather up his lost people is like a mother hen wanting to gather up her chicks. How often I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. And Jesus said that when we are lost and at our end, we cry out to God our Father to save us. And in doing this, Jesus invents a fourth way that we can think about how to speak about God. Because Jesus went past just the third step of wanting to speak about God in a holy way. Jesus wanted to talk about God in a way that was totally determined by our sense of lostness and needing to be saved. And in that moment of lostness, needing to be able to call clearly on a God who sees you and knows you and loves you and wants to rescue you from your wandering. And when Jesus invented that, when he was like, how should we talk about God who speaks to that need, that essential situation that we are all in in this world, Jesus called God Father. Jesus called God Father all the time. He prayed to his Father. He talked about his Father. He invited people to know his Father. He said that his Father had sent him. This 
relationship of calling on God his Father to deliver and provide and hear and answer and save provided for Jesus the main backdrop against which he understood and taught about God. And it is why for Christians that the normative way that we talk about God is to call God our Father. There's a God in heaven whose name is holy, and Jesus taught us to call him Father. Now, what does this mean? This doesn't mean that we don't draw on feminine images for God. They're in the Bible. They are biblical. Jesus drew on them, and we learn about God and ourselves when we draw on them. This doesn't mean that because we call God Father that we think men are better than women. There's no place for hierarchies to be drawn out of this God language. That, that, that's not what this is about. It doesn't even necessarily mean that we think God is male, right? We talked about God as a spirit. God is spirit. It doesn't even mean that we're saying that God is male. Obviously, there is a sense in which in the incarnation, God has participated in some way in maleness in the body of Jesus. But the major point of the incarnation is that Jesus became a human, not that he just became a man. All humans participate in the humanness of Jesus. What does this mean? It means that in this time, the primary way, the primary relationship and language that we use to know God is as a father who saves us. And the problem with confusion in the world today about how to talk to God is that you do not know who to call on in your hour of need if you don't know how to talk to God and how to talk about God. And I, I do think, as much as I love ideas and understanding them, and this conversation about God language is an honest, intellectual conversation to have. And at the same time, I do think that even honest intellectual conversations can have spiritual dynamics underneath them that affect our faith. And I think that in this time of confusion, the enemy is using confusion about how to talk about God to create distance between you and God so that you do not know who to call on. Yeah. You need to know who to call on. And when we do that, we receive the revelation that God has given us in that moment that our Father in heaven has sent his Son to save us. This is also a matter of faithfulness. This is how Jesus talked about God and how he taught his disciples to talk about God. If the sacrifices Jesus displayed cannot be with our faithfulness repaid, then self-deceive and fake Christians we ourselves have made. We should respond in faithfulness to Jesus. And when you encounter these things in the world, when you encounter perspectives that, as the Bible uh, says, uh, makes your ears itch, our ears are scabby today. <laughs> It's supposed to be a gross image with how much we're just like, ah, I want to I hear the things I want to hear, right? I want to I wanna listen to the teachers I want to listen to. I want to listen to the people who are telling me the things that I want to know. When you go to itch your ears in response to something like that, you should have a simple response. What has Jesus said about this subject? What has Jesus said about this subject? In a time of deep, disorienting, biblical, and theological confusion, Vineyard Manhattan will continue to speak simply and clearly about our Heavenly Father and in doing that, standing with the authority of Jesus. And at the same time, we will witness to the full scope and spectrum of the biblical picture about the nature of God and the language that is used to describe God, including and at times specifically centering on the feminine images and metaphors that are used to describe God in the Bible. Because God does mother us. <laughs> God cares for us like a good mother. God has birthed us like a good mother. And when we're far away, God wants to gather us back up like a good mother. The God that we believe in and that we proclaim to the world is our Father in heaven who loves us like a good mom would. Yes. 